Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. Today's topic is Wrestlest Remarkable Books, number 27. The first book today is People of the Deer, Farley Mowat, 1952. This is, a, I think, my favorite book by Farley Mowat, who's a tremendous author. Um, Mowat's this Canadian fellow who writes about the cold places. He considered himself a northern man. I believe he died in the past year. Anyway, this book takes place in the far north in Canada, uh, west of the Hudson Bay, in the, in the actually the, the northern part of the Hudson Bay. And it deals with uh, these Canadian Indians and, uh, in that area. And Mowat went and lived and spent some time with them. I don't know how he communicated, but he did. And uh, he uh, had quite an experience. The people there uh, lived almost entirely, their food was caribou meat. It's a very, very cold area. And uh, the caribou meat apparently had, had, a lot, was very, had a lot of fat. And this gave them a lot of body fat, which helped them to stay warm. Uh, he uh, spent time in their homes, which were just tents, and were, were not heated. You know, so they, 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 they didn't have heated homes. But, but they basically survived uh, through caribou meat, and uh, that, that kept them warm. They had body fat. And uh, he, uh, you know, there he was, you know, learning about them, and they were curious about him. And he had some uh, writing paper. He, wa- he They asked him to draw a picture with his drawing paper, and he did. And he showed them this picture. And then they all started laughing and laughing and laughing. thought it was absolutely hilarious. He was a little bit alarmed because they just, you know, this laughter went on and on and on. And, uh, and, and one of the fellows, you know, lost uh, control and fell backward and poked a hole in the tent or this. Uh, and uh, anyway, and then uh, shortly thereafter, they, they, someone had been preparing this caribou meat for the day, their food. And then they all became very quiet, you know, because this is <laughs> in pre- preparation for, for consuming caribou meat. And uh, he, uh, he, 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 he watched the people, they, the, I know the women would keep their babies on their back, you know, uh, bundled up, and they would have, um, I think, uh, grasses uh, would be used sort of, instead of a diaper, they would have some, some uh, natural th- things that would be used to, to collect the waste or absorb the waste of their children. He actually asked the, if they, uh, he, he noticed that there didn't seem to be any discipline of the children, and he asked them, you know, if they ever you know, hit beat their children, you know, to, uh, to discipline them. And they were, they were horrified at the thought of this, you know, that anyone would beat a child. And anyway, they were very, he really had a good time. They were, you know, seemed to be a very happy people. And uh, this is a wonderful book. Of, of course, it's a va- vanished way of life because, you know, the change came to these people. This is 1952. That's quite a kind of long time ago. Uh, and we'll, I'll talk later. And, and he came back years later and wrote, wrote another book about what had happened to them as time passed. The next book is First and Last Seasons, A Father, a Son, and Sunday Afternoon Football by Dan McGraw, 2000. And I, I really enjoyed this book. It's about, a, it's about Cleveland and about being a Cleveland Browns football fan. You know, and uh, this is something, that this theme, fathers and sons in professional sports, because this is what I you know, did with my father. We, you know, watched games, listened to games, and went to games. And now with my son, Tim. Uh, the thing that bothered me about this was that there's too much drinking. Yeah, especially the NFL fans. I have friends who have very good uh, season tickets to the Cleveland Cavaliers, Cleveland Indians. They don't go. They don't. They don't want to go to Browns games because there's way too much drinking. And I felt the author was ready for Alcoholics Anonymous because there's so much drinking in this book. And he also repeats this idea. That Cleveland is a city of losers, which I, I strongly disagree with, and that's that's an attitude, and that's why I I felt my Cleveland City of Champions project was so important because we need to have positive thinking. Otherwise, it was it's actually a, it's a very nice uh, book about being a Cleveland Browns football fan uh, with fathers and sons, watching Browns games on Sunday afternoons. The next book is The Desert King. By David Haworth, 1965. This is a tremendous book. Incredible. It's a fascinating account of the life of Ibn Saud, the, fa- the founder of Saudi Arabia. You know, Saudi Arabia is actually named after the Saud family. They're the royal family that rule, uh, that, rule that country. 
And, uh, you know, it's, it's that amazing because they were a very uh, simple, very poor people, very primitive and uh, desert people, you know, very tough to make a living in the desert. And uh, uh, so they, they, and they had the part of their culture really was fighting, you know, was warfare, big part of that. And then, and then life changed dramatically because of this incredible oil wealth. Made so, so Saudi Arabia, if you went back in time in the early part of the 20th century, these, these people were super poor, desert people just trying to survive, and, um, and, and you didn't have very much. And then they had, and, and then over, starting really, I think, in the 1930s, uh, and up until now, this vast wealth was created. And, um, and actually, I think this is why you had guys like Osama bin Laden, who who, who uh, well, the, the, the earlier generations of, of Saudis, you know, they got all this money, so they started buying stuff. And they, they really got carried away with buying because they could buy almost anything they wanted. And then, uh, so this, this, this led to cultural problems. You know, when a culture gets so much money so fast, really without working for it, you know, they hadn't worked for it, it was just there. And, you know, foreigners started giving them a lot of money. At first, they really didn't know how to spend it. And actually, so Osama bin Laden, I think, is sort of a symptom of the problems that the, in that culture with all this money. And he was kind of rejecting all this, what he saw as dissipation, you know, and this lives of uh, luxury, you know. And so he developed this lifestyle, which was pretty bad, but it was also austere when he made war on the West. And then the Saudis developed an idea that, oh, we got all this money, so this means that Islam is, you know, is this uh, special, is, is, the, is the great religion, and that the whole, whole world should become Muslim. And, of course, the, the holy cities are in Saudi Arabia, Mecca and Medina. I, I really recommend this book, an incredible story of Saudi Arabia. The next book is The Best Kept Secret by Les Roberts, 1999. This is another outstanding Milan Yakovich mystery thriller set in Cleveland, Ohio. And Yakovich solves the crime and is a good guy. Uh, there mentions... Ah! Oh, gosh. Sorry about that. Mentions uh, Sherman College, which I think is actually... He was actually talking about Oberlin, where my father went. So, yeah, I really enjoy all these uh, Milan Yakovich uh, novels. Set in Cleveland, Ohio. The next, the next book is Indians on the Game by Wayne Stewart, 2001. And this was a fairly short book. I bought it new and I paid, paid, a, paid a, pr a pretty penny. And it's an inside look at baseball. Um, one of the lines that got me was, Way back in 1975, and I thought, what do you, what do you mean way back? In, that wasn't that long ago, but I guess it, it all depends on your perspective. So you have these, they got these Cleveland Indians, they interviewed and talked about, you know, their experiences playing professional baseball in Cleveland. The next book is Betty Ford, The Times of My Life by Betty Ford with Chris Chase, 1978. This is a wonderful book. Uh, Betty Ford was first lady of the United States when her husband, Gerald Ford, became president in 1974 when Richard Nixon resigned and uh, he had been vice president. And then he served and he was uh, defeated in the 1976 election by Jimmy Carter. And so he served from 74 into early 1977. And so this book is all about Betty Ford talks about her life. Now, what it was life be like being the, uh, the first lady and... Uh, she loved, she loved to dance. They raised four children. And she had a major challenge that her husband was never home. You know, he was all, his political career was all consuming. This involved a lot of travel. And so she had a hard time with this. She, she developed breast cancer and, and alcoholism. And she, she uh, found recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous. And she, she founded the Betty Ford Clinic for uh, a recovery for alco alcoholism. That would have helped... Uh, the sons of uh, John Adams, who didn't get help way back when. So she's a good person, and I think she's gone now. But she, you know, she really did a lot of good, and she, you know, she was you know, she was a good, fine lady, and uh, you know, she did a lot to promote Alcoholics Anonymous to help, to get help for alcoholics who who are who are suffering and who are dying of that horrible disease. The next book is Pressure by Sam Ritigliano, 1988. 
Uh, Sam Ortigliano was the head coach of the Cleveland Browns back in the 80, well, late 70s into the early 80s. And, of course, that uh, famous 1980 season, they are called the Cardiac Kids and had won all these thrilling games at, at near the end, of the end of the games. And uh, he talks about his life growing up as an Italian-American in Brooklyn, New York, falling in love, find, finding God, his coaching odyssey. You know, these professional coaches, you know, they're always moving. They get jobs here and then they, for a period of time. And they're always, they're, you know, they're all trying to rise through the ranks and they have to uh, be an assistant coach somewhere. And then, of course, he made it to the top, became a, uh, a head coach. And then he, he talks about he had some of his uh, players develop drug addiction, uh, cocaine, I, I believe cocaine. And, you know, he tried to help them. He was, he was a, he's a good man, very good man, really good fellow. And he did a good job in Cleveland. And, you know, he not only was a great coach, an outstanding coach, but he was a good man. And he, he cared about his players, you know. It's not just about winning games. It's about caring about each other. So this is a fine book. And, you know, the title is Pressure, and that's really what you're, you're dealing with when you're a professional uh, coach, NFL coach, because, uh, you know, they only play once a week, and so that's, that's tough. You know, they, and, and you, you got to win, right, because that's what the fans want. The next book is The Desperate People by Farley Mowat, published in 1959. This is the sequel to the to people of the deer, he he returned seven years later to these Canadian to see these uh, Canadian Indians in the far north, uh, in the far north west of the Hudson Bay, and he found things had changed dramatically for the worse for them, because they no longer were able to hunt for caribou, and then the, the Canadian government was trying to uh, was uh, forcing change upon them, and one of the things they tried to get them to do was. You know, they had to eat, so they said, okay, you guys can fish now. You can fish. And, well, that the thing is, uh, the fish that they wanted them to eat didn't have enough fat content to keep them warm. And so that, of course, this meant they had to live in heated homes. You know, and so, and so this, this, the country was, or these people were really um, you know, deteriorating and then developing uh, because their, their traditional way of life was taken away. And then the modern, what was the modern, the modern way? It was, they had a lot of trouble with it. it developed depression and a suicide and alcoholism and so forth. So this was, it's very, very tragic what happened to these people. And of course it happened to really all American Indians in North and South America with this, uh, this very tough adjustment they had to make to the, to the Western ways. And this was heartbreaking for Farley Mowat because he, he saw the change in only, in only seven years. And, uh, I found this a profound, thoughtful, and soul-searching book. A wonderful book and very, very, very heartbreaking. But it's good to face reality. The next book is Cy Young, A Baseball Life, read by Reed Browning, 2000. And uh, this is the, man, the story of the man behind the Cy Young Award, which is given every year to the best pitcher in each of the two uh, leagues, the American League and National League. He grew up on a farm in Tuscarawas County, Ohio, and he achieved a tremendous success as a professional baseball player playing for the Cleveland Spiders. Actually, he was the star pitcher when the Cleveland Spiders won the 1895 uh, Professional Baseball Championship. He played for St. Louis, Boston, and then came back to Cleveland. He was a manager of the 1913 Cleveland Green Sox. He won 511 uh, games as a pitcher. And of course, that wouldn't happen today. Back when he pitched, they I think it was like a three-man rotation. And nowadays, it's very rare just to get 300. And nobody's there's no, once in a while guys make it that far. But uh, and now with relief pitchers, you know that makes it harder for pitchers to win games. Uh, he was a good man. I found this an inspiring book. You know, as as you know, he had made pretty good money, but uh, he was a farmer, and uh, oh, yeah, farming is a tough business. And eventually, he he lost his money, and he had to sell his farm, as, and he was an old man. And he had never had, his wife died, they had never had any children, they weren't able to have children, and then he, he was in his 60s, and he got a job in a hotel in this uh, small town where he lived in Ohio, because he needed to, needed to work, he didn't have any money. And then he was, because he, but uh, a lot of people knew him, and then uh, there was a family, a couple, who invited him to live with them. Because uh, you know he didn't have any children to take care of him, so he he, he accepted their offer, 
you know, because they they cared about him. And then he became very close to their daughter. It was very touching as he in the final years of his life. And I thought, so it just shows if you're a good person, things will work out. He was a good man, and and he lost all his money and he lost his farm. But since he was a good guy, people, you know, he had good karma and and good things, and he was taken care of when as an as an old man. So it's a, he was not only a tremendous uh, baseball player, but he was, he was a good person, which is, even more, which is much more important. The next book is Giant Steps, the autobiography of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Peter Nobler, 1983. thought this was a wonderful book. It's the life of the uh, story of the NBA superstar, that who, who played, originally his name was Lou Al Sindor, that's the name he grew up with, and he became a Muslim, changed his name to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Grew up in New York City, and uh, he was, you know, a real tall fellow, did, did real well, and one thing he talked about is how he developed a resentment, because, uh, you know, when, of course, when he would do well and the teams would win, everyone's happy, and then, of course, you can't win all the time, and then, it, and then he, you know, he would play in a game and play 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 hard, and then they would lose because that's that's what sometimes happens. And the people would be very upset and disappointed and hurt. And and he he felt like wow, all these people are their happiness is dependent on him and and the team. So that, that you know that was tough. He met Wilt Chamberlain. He was uh, did very well at UCLA uh, in college, and then he played for the Milwaukee Bucks initially. And won, won, won an NBA championship with them. And then the, uh, that's the only title the Bucks have ever won. And then he got traded to the L.A. Lakers, where he won a number of titles, playing with Michael, with uh, Magic Johnson and coached by Pat Riley. And uh, he actually uh, met Joe Lapchick at one point, who was, I, I think, a coach when he was younger, who had played for the Cleveland Rosenblums. That caught my eye. So, and, and, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had the most, uh, he has the record for the most uh, points uh, scored in a career, about 38,000 some points, which is up till now is still the record. And, and I think uh, some of the guys, oh yeah, Carl Malone looked like he had a chance, but he fell short and, you know, Michael Jordan fell short, Kobe Bryant fell short. So that's still the record. We'll see if LeBron James can break that record or anyone else. So it's a really interesting story of, of the NBA, mostly in the 1970s and into the 80s. The next book is The Last One Home by Annette Apollo, 1999. Well, I, you know, this, this, this book appealed to me. It's the story of this, this, the author who went back to her hometown. And, of course, a lot of people they, from these small towns, you know, they, they leave. You know, they want to see the world, go to the big city and she wrote about going home, and it's a story about friends and family and death and reconnecting with, with old friends and family members. And I read this because I had this very strong desire to live in a small town. I never really did. I lived in a suburb here in, in Rocky River, Ohio, but it's, it's, you know, it's part of the Cleveland area. And so I really had the strong desire to live in Marion, Ohio, which I actually did for, for four months and sort of got that out of my system. So the, this this book appealed to me the whole idea of community in in, in in a small town in America, warm supportive community. The next book is the National Pastime uh, by John Thorne, nineteen eighty two. Uh, this is a baseball book. It's about the history of baseball. So I thought it was pretty interesting. You know, guys like Fred Merkel, a guy who. Uh, he didn't. Uh, he made a mistake in a, in a, in a very important in a baseball game. He played for the New York Giants, I believe, or maybe the Brooklyn Dodgers. And he, he didn't. Uh, he didn't step on second at the end of a game. The running runs scored. He was, I think, on first, and and then they found out. Oh, he didn't. Then they could, um, since there were two outs, somebody got the ball and they stepped on second and they got second, and and then it was uh, the run didn't count. So it was. Uh, so this is a big controversy at the time, and he had to live with this for the rest of his life. They, they got dark; they couldn't finish the game, so they had, had to. And then the, I think his team uh, ended up losing when they resumed play the next day. Fleet Walker, who was the, uh, an African American player in the 1800s, Hack Wilson, who set the record for RBIs, uh, Dick Allen, who when he played in the American League, it was Dick Allen. When he went to the National League, he was Richie Allen. 
and, and so forth. And he kept, uh, yeah, originally he was uh, Richie Allen in the National League, was traded to the American League, became Dick Allen. And when he went back, he went back to being Richie Allen again. So I thought this was a, this was a pretty, good, pretty good book. The next book is Fatso Football When Men Were Really Men by Arthur J. Donovan Jr. and Bob Drury, 1987. This is a wonderful book. It's about the former Baltimore Colts lineman, Fatso, they called him Fatso Donovan. Yeah, that's not very, that's not very politically correct today. I guess he accepted that as, as, as a name. You know, he was, he was a big guy, and he, he knew he was, he was big. And he told, told, tells all about his life, and he's, he's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Kind of unusual for a lineman, you know, to become famous, or at least to write a book. But he had a big personality. He's very, very outgoing, very charismatic. And it's a, this is about the NFL in the 1950s. And the, uh, the, the Baltimore Colts, who won the NFL championship in 1958 and 59, and then they called the 1958 NFL championship the greatest game ever played. And... Uh, so he, the thing that got me about this book is he lived on, seemed like he lived on meat, salami, bologna, cold cuts, French fries, and Schlitz beer. He weighed 300 pounds. Of course, today he wouldn't be that big. And I remember one time he was talking about his, he had, he wasn't a great student. He talked about how his mother would like, uh, would, uh, you know, bring uh, cakes to the, uh, to the teachers to try to get, so he could get a passing grade, which sounded very familiar to, from what I remember. From what I my experience was in the Philippines, when when you have a tr- tough when your kids are having a tough time and the parents are want to help the kids pass even though they're having such a tough time maybe they, they they're, they're trying hard that trying their best and they just can't make it so that's when you show up with a cake for the teacher. The next book is when you and your mother can't be friends, resolving the most complicated relationship of your life by Victoria Segunda, nineteen ninety. This is mostly about mothers and daughters, but I read it because of I had a lot of difficulties in my relationship with my mother, and uh, I can't. Like the conclusion I came to is I needed to meditate more. <laughs> and he, he talks. She talks about trying the need to for to, to try to understand each other, you know, and and to and to forgive. And forgiveness is so important. And learn 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 your family history to try to. To help your relationship, you know, if we understood each other more, that would that would that would make a big di- big difference. And you know, we need to let go of these grievances and resentments. Yeah, we all hurt each other, and we, and we don't we don't have to hold on to these resentments. We need to let go and forgive because we've all we've all hurt others and we've all been hurt. So, um, and I, this is the con- con- conclusion I came to with my mother. She was a good mother, and I was a good son. And but we, you know, we had these problems for whatever for, for whatever reasons. The next book is Building a Champion by Bill Walsh with Glenn Dickey, 1990. Well, this is some book. Bill Walsh was the coach of the uh, San Francisco 49ers, who I believe won four, three Super Bowls during his time. And, of course, Joe Montana was his star quarterback. As a young man, he had, uh, he had been an assistant coach with Paul Brown, I believe in Cincinnati, Cincinnati Bengals. And... Uh, Car- uh, Carmen Policy and Dwight Clark uh, were a part of the 49ers with him. So when, when I read this book, I was hoping that the, they would be able to bring some of the Bill Walsh magic to Cleveland, but it, you know, it really didn't happen. You know, when, when, uh, when Carmen Policy was the president of the Browns and Dwight Clark was the general manager. Anyway, uh, Bill Walsh was a very good man, did, did a real good job. You know, he won these the, four, the San Francisco 49ers were a tremendous team, and it was really because of him and his leadership. The next book is Out of Their League by Dave Magiesi, 1971. Uh, this, this fellow played in the NFL with the St. Louis Cardinals from 1962 to 1969. And yeah, he, this, you know, so in the 60s, which was you know, the, this radical time and, and with the, uh, the, the hippies and the youth movement, the anti-Vietnam War, and he became radicalized. He eventually... Uh, Developed a very negative attitude about professional football, saw it as a, something very violent and and terrible, and so he was really actually became anti NFL. Kind of reminded me of my sister Pamela, who thought that the NFL was wrong. You know that there was this all this violence that, uh, and well, I don't know. I uh, he talks about Jim Brown, 
And I don't know, I find my, I can, I can understand his point. You, you see these poor fellows, you know, they really premat- age prematurely and they have so many phys- health problems. Um, but nowadays, you know, they, they really know, they know the, that, that, that can happen. And, you know, as a fan, it, it is, it is compelling. Uh, it's, it is entertaining. And if you're a fan, you want your team to win. So anyway, uh, the next book is Falling from Grace by Terry Pluto, 19, published in 1995. Uh, Pluto is talking about the problems in the NBA, uh, the grossly overpaid players who have behavioral problems. And at that time, the game was slowed down, became very defensive. The CBA, which was kind of a minor league, uh, minor league basketball league, he talks about Lenny Wilkins, who was the player and coach for the for the Cavaliers, Wayne Embry, who was GM, Danny Ferry, who was a player and later a GM, Joe Tate who was the uh, radio, ma- radio announcer of the Cleveland Cavaliers. No mention of the Cleveland Rosenblums, however. Terry Pluto is a wonderful, I think he's probably one of the best uh, authors of books, uh, sports books in the United States. He's, writ- he's written about 15 or 20. Does a good job. The next book is Never Cry Wolf by Farley Mowat, 1963. This is another wonderful book by Farley Mowat, this tremendous Canadian author, writes about uh, natural places, the people and animals in remote places in Canada. And, uh, you know, wolves have had a bad reputation over the years as being, you know, sort of violent, uh, cruel animals, and people are afraid of them. But, uh, and according to this book, that's a myth. Wolves are not cruel and vicious. Uh, He studied wolves in the Canadian Arctic, and he learned that wolves are peaceful, gentle, and playful, and that man is the cruel one. So this is a and according one of the things he mentioned is that uh, you know there's an idea of, of wolves attacking. And he said this, it isn't true. It, wolves really don't attack people because you know the thing is they are dogs, and uh, dogs are a man's best friend. So this is a this is a book all about uh, talking about wolves and, and and giving them a better reputation, and telling the truth about wolves that they are not evil animals and we should not we should not fear them. The next book is The Babe Ruth Story by Babe Ruth and Bob Considine, 1948. This is a delightful autobiography of the Babe, who was the greatest baseball player of all time. And as he was dying, this you know, it was a very touching thing Babe Ruth wrote. I've got to stick around a long, long time. For above everything else, I want to be a part of and help the development of the greatest game God ever saw fit to let man invent, baseball. Wonderful quote. Of course, he died, actually. So uh, he was such an, yeah, Babe Ruth, really, he made home runs popular before him. But guys weren't trying to hit home runs. He had 714, which was the record for a very long time. Until it was broken by Hank Aaron and, uh, and later Barry Bonds. Yeah, you know, he was a very, he started off as a pitcher for the Brooklyn, uh, for the Boston Red Sox. He had a tough childhood in, a, uh, in an orphanage. His Parents couldn't take him. His mother was sick. His father couldn't take care of him. So he had a very tough childhood. But then uh, he became very successful in baseball, and he got traded to the New York Yankees, where he started, started hitting all these home runs and won a lot of championships. And he had a real personality. People loved Babe Ruth, even though one year he, the, the World Series ended on a caught stealing. He got caught stealing. But people still forgave him because he, he had such an endearing personality. He was very playful, although he developed... Uh, a drinking problem, and he didn't didn't eat well. And then he got involved with uh, he was had a problems with with women. He was had too many women, and he didn't have a healthy lifestyle. He was a good man, Babe Ruth. This, this is a fine biography of him. It appears we are out of time. I hope you find a good book to read. Books are wonderful things. I think they they really make make life better. Very so many interesting books to read, and hope you find a nice book to read. Thank you so much for watching. My friend was telling me it takes patience to watch these. So anyway, I'll see you next time. God bless you.